Hey everyone, I'm Dan from jazzcomposerspresent.com, an online space where composers, musicians, and listeners come together to celebrate the music we love. I'm joined today by Emilio Solia, Latin Grammy winning and twice Grammy nominated composer, arranger, pianist, and educator. Emilio is here to show us how to unlock the power of reharmonization. To be honest with you, what I think I'm doing is trying to use this as a tool to take you further into the process of composing. Let me show you the first uh, sample, which would be just a simple melody. You know, you wake up one morning, you go to the piano, the guitar, wherever you write, and you come up with this fantastic, inspired idea. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, do, 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 do. I did on purpose a very short thing so that we can be using it for um, a bunch of different um, reharmonization techniques that, as I said, will take us somewhere else that might be, at the end of the day, more interesting. But let's hear to this sample one, which would be maybe the first harmony that came to your fingers when you first played this. That's not bad, right? For a very diatonic, very C major or A minor kind of harmony. Like I was thinking of that, like maybe in this case, it's pointing a little bit more to the A minor because of the harmonic sequence. But as you see, we are using a very diatonic harmony in the beginning, and then we're using that kind of um, triton substitute in the E7, right, going down to the E flat major 7, that could be a flat 3 of the C major scale, whatever, you know, we just have a cool harmony. But what I propose you to do whenever you have an idea and whenever you are harmonizing is even if you have something that you like, and I did kind of a cool one on purpose at the beginning, um, try to have like a list of things that you want to put that melodic idea uh, through. For example, uh, start trying to put everything into a longer harmonic rhythm, even the obvious ones that I listed there in the number two, you know, because as we see, that melody could hold very well over a C major, uh, as a one of C major, or even a G7, sus probably because we start with the C, uh, or A minor, D minor, even B flat major, as it says there. We had a sample here, but it doesn't make sense to, to play that audio. Let's move to the next one, which would bring the idea of start playing around with shorter harmonic rhythms. Now you see that I am changing the chord symbols every bar. And I think the interesting game there, and I, again, that's why I chose such a simple um, melodic example, is because you can go from one to five in this case, so activating the second part of the phrase, which would be more usual in terms of traditional harmony, or you can do exactly the opposite here. You can have the dominant at the beginning and resolve, have the arrival point uh, in the note G of the melody in the next bar. And of course, as you see, I'm using these possibilities, like the second part of the bar can be a G7 with some tension. So we go from the G sus to some more tension and then resolve. Or we can have a D minor go to the G7 or an A flat major or an A flat seven, actually, right? Which would be a triton substitute of the D7, which of course I didn't write it down, but you, you get the picture. Like you can start playing around with this kind of subdominant, dominant, and resolution. The resolution can also go to a broken cadence or deceptive cadence, going to that A flat major. Here under number four, I listed already, <clears throat> you know, starting to do a little bit more complex here. Now I'm pointing to the A minor because, again, this idea could be perfectly in A minor. We don't know, actually, as we will see. In a minute, it could go to F major as well because the B is not implied in the melody, so we don't know if it's a B or a B flat. So this whole thing could be an F major a chunk of music. We still don't know. But let's say A minor is our target. So now we're coming from the E7 to the A minor. And that E7, we can uh, put a dominant of that E7, a secondary dominant, which would be the B7 flat 9, the substitute, which I listed there, the F7, 13, and then I, I put that out there because I, I listed the, the B half diminished also as a possibility. And, um, you know, I know it's not legal. Like they say that the uh, flat nine is not an available tension in the half diminished course, but guys, it's an available tension. We'll talk about that later with a cup of coffee. But right now, B half diminished with a C on top, yes, absolutely. And if you want a further justification, just think of it as a dissonance, accented dissonance that goes smoothly into the D 
and the D is an, uh, is an acceptable node because it's a third of the core. Anyway, you can have the B have diminished J going into the E7 and resolving into the A minor as well. And maybe we can listen to this example, number four. Well, another possibility, as I mentioned before, maybe we are in F major. So how about harmonizing this with 251 to F major would, would be that G minor 7 going to C7 going to F6, and there it says C page 4, because that's where, you know, the things get really juicy. Oh, we can listen to number 5, which is uh, dividing the um, harmonic rhythm even further. You can harmonize every note. Any of those quarter notes can have its own harmony, and this is a nice descending chromatic line in the bass that jumps finally to the D minor. There's a big arrow. There's a couple of arrows that starts happening there, which is why this is useful. You see, for example, from the E7, then when I discovered that I could go to F major 7, I can. I also thought, oh, maybe the E7 can go like in a you know, broken cadence or deceptive cadence, I think in English, from the E7 to F major. You know, So I don't need to write the whole thing. I just put an arrow. The same with the A7 going back up to the A flat 7. So that's why I'm selling you this... Um, idea of working, just put the melodic idea and write tons of harmonies with certain plan, with certain uh, schedule of doing things in an order. And now we can visit maybe a couple of um, non-functional harmonies. It's kind of parallel, a chromatic thing where the notes of the melody could be anything, but in this case, I decided that they could be, uh, this of course is not diatonic, right? And they are the major third of all this bunch of major seven chords. So as you move up, every chord move up exactly chromatically like they're planing together. Uh, and it reminded me when I played of some of those cool introductions from the from the 80s uh, Al Jarro albums. You know, this could be a tan, kum, kin, chak, kum, you know, that kind of thing. Let's see your number six. Uh, number seven will bring us another possibility, which is triads with a bass in some, I don't know, funny place that doesn't belong to the triad, that does not display a clear inversion of a chord, but just a triad with some, let's call it triad with crazy bass. Again, tensions, you know, color, but in this case, they are not moving parallelly, but I thought, okay, let's have minor seven chords with an 11 somewhere. And let's have a contrary motion in the bass and the melody. So these chords that I'm playing here, they all are minor seven with 11 and some other tensions. So the color uh, stays uh, constant. And also the melody becomes some kind of cool tension in the chord. And many of the times, a little bit, I was thinking, you know, we have this beautiful composition by uh, Charlie Mingus that is called Duke Ellington's Sound of Love. Uh, where if you check on the beginning of the melody, almost the whole thing is built on the sharp 11 and nines and six, like the whole thing in the melody is tension. That ends up creating a color which is very consistent throughout the, um, the phrase. So let's hear number eight. I have a number nine now, which is try a different rhythm with the harmony that is it has like a different time signature. Let's think of the harmony having a different time signature than the one which is in the melody. Like in this case, it would be, I try with um, one, two, three, one, two, three. You see in the, in the upper line, you have the um, quarter note and the half note, quarter note and the half note. And I also thought there was a nice example on Tad Jones' arrangement of um, Cole Porter's I Get a Kick Out of You. You can check that out. The tune is in, in four, but he starts in the intro a couple of bars and makes it look like a three. And he creates that because the harmony is changing in three, four. As you see, I play the, the harmony in the 
in the upper line, which is only two bars. But this is where I was trying to get. Because as I was working, I did that, and then I played it again, and I realized that this idea about creating a one, two, three, one, two, three, a, a harmony that moves quarter note to half note created more music. This is the dessert. This is where we're really trying to get da da di da doom and then party in D minor going to G. The melody went fa sol and I went do C C B. You know, with those two voices, kind of a, the harmony created a counterpoint that was against the direction of the melody, just an inversion, and then it gave me a couple more bars of music. This is the precious thing about working. Now we started with a very silly do re mi fa sol, you know, a silly thing. But now here we start having a seven bars of a composition. And this, as you observe here, will be because, again, I was working, trying to reharmonize that. And because of this, da da di ba pam, I, I fall in that G with the B7, sharp five, and that pushed me to resolve that G into an A, to the party. And that took me to that thing, which is an inversion, and that got into that kind of a minor, the minor with the major seven thing there, um, which I think is not bad. And it, you know, it kept pushing. This would not have happened if the composer, if the crafter, which is that's what we are, we are crafters, was not sitting there, you know, with a pencil and a piece of paper doing the job, which is in this case, reharmonizing. That's what you need to think about. You need to have, and there are the examples in the great music that we love from, you know, Mozart onwards about reharmonizing the same idea with a bunch of possibilities is so, so useful. Even the obvious ones, like the ones I listed, one to five, you're just accumulating information, accumulating possibilities to develop the piece because if you're writing a liturgy, this one thing, but if you're planning to do a more composed through longer work, you might need to get to that motif many times and it would be very nice to have different harmonic possibilities. If you start doing this kind of exercise, for example, with harmony, but it could be with counterpoint, it could be with rhythm, it could be eventually with some orchestral ideas, some timbrical ideas about who's going to play that. That can trigger things. Hope this triggers some ideas about how to work when the work is not coming. Thanks for watching today's mini lesson. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Drop any questions, comments, or suggestions for future videos down below. To watch our full-length events and participate in live Q&As with our presenting artists, head to jazzcomposerspresent.com. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.